together. Welcome and honor Pastor Megan Robinson. What's up, Zion Church? Are you excited to be here this morning? You guys are louder than first service. I'm proud of you. Look at you. You had time to wake up and get caffeine. That is so, so good. Hey, I, I just want to take a moment and just give honor where honor is due because you guys have really a gift in your pastors and Pastor John and Pastor Taryn. And I just, I want you guys to know, and I said it in first service, but I'm going to repeat it again so that second service hears what I'm saying love you guys and we believe in you and we're so incredibly honored to do life with you and to build God's house alongside of you in Orange County. You guys are incredible leaders. You're incredible pastors. And what we see in the reflection of your church is a reflection of your leadership. And so we just honor you today. Can you guys give them a great big hand clap? You got, you got to know you have pastors. They are amazing. And uh, Carrie and I have loved getting to know them and we're excited to continue getting to know them as we move forward. Hey, I just want to tell you a tiny bit about myself. And as we're starting, let me just preface with that was me coughing and making all the noise backstage. So I have a bottle. I'm just determined that I'm not going to cough during this service today. But if I do, we're going to go on and uh, believe God's going to show up. But again, my name is Megan. My husband, Carrie, and I, we pastor the Movement Church. And uh, we, we love what we get to do, building God's house and his kingdom here in Orange County. We've got two girls. We church planted quite a um, So my girls were little when we church planted. But I think they have a picture of my family that's real old. Um, this is my family in a real stretched out, wide yeah, it's not, it's not doing us a lot of justice, but that's all right. Um, this is my girls. Um, my oldest is Brooklyn, and she is 20 years old, to say, and about to be a senior at Pepperdine next year. And it's just crazy to be in that season of a journey of life with her. Um, and the youngest is Avery. She is 15 now, a freshman. This picture is old. Um, and I just, I love building the house of God with my kids. Um, they are, they're so is, uh, he is just, you've got to meet him. He's just hysterical and uh, will make you laugh. Um, so that's my family. And uh, I told you a little bit about the church and I, I'm really going to kick off this morning with a little story about myself and give you a little inside glimpse of, of me. Instagram. My name is Diva Pastor. And um, I, I, people sometimes wave at me. They're like, hi, Diva Pastor. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's not my real name. Um, if there's a long story behind where that came from, but I usually tell people, like, I'm really not a diva. And that's been the story that I've told for a long time. I know that's what it is, diva. But the story I'm going to tell you this morning um, might say otherwise, because I think in some ways I really am a diva. And uh, I, I have this tent on the stage. My husband just got back from camping yesterday. And here's the truth about us. We don't camp campers in the room, passionate camp. There's only a few of you. What's hysterical is the guys trying to set this tent up. They were like, we don't camp. We don't know what to do. So really proud of you guys. You figured it out. You, you get me then. Like, I don't camp. I like hotels. I like nice, warm showers. I like comfortable duvet cover on top of it. I like coffee in the morning in my, ho like, that is what I like to do if I'm going to go somewhere. But I know some like avid campers. Like they, they love camping and everything about it. That is just not me. Um, but early in our ministry, we lived in Texas. We were youth pastors. And early in our ministry, we used to plan things to take our students or our student leaders to that would be fun and exciting for them. Come on, students, you know you like something fun and exciting. You have something coming up. I heard you talking about it. So we planned to take all of our young leaders on this excursion, find out my husband and our team without me knowing, planned that the excursion was going to be a camping trip. We lived in Texas and we were gonna go camping in Oklahoma. And I was like, you have got to be kidding me. Why are we going camping? And they're like, don't worry, Megan, we've planned everything fun. You're going to love it. You only have to sleep outside one night. It's okay. Like there's no, there's not going to be any issues. And I'm like, okay. So at this point, here I am, I'm in it. And so we head out on this camping trip and I've got my little two-year-old daughter with me at the time. And we are someplace where we're supposed to camp. 
And we show up and it's beautiful, you guys. There's a river that's down below us and it's just flowing and we're kind of on the mountains and the trees are just singing the praises of God. It's like amazing. And I'm looking and I'm like, well, where's the campsite? Like, where, where do we camp? And my team looks at me, all these young adults and my husband, who's kind of nervous at this point, look at me and they're like, well, here's the thing. We're gonna load all of our things into those canoes down there and we're gonna canoe until we a place to camp. And I was like, until we find one? Are you kidding me? And they're like, it's gonna be great, Megan. So we make our way down to the canoes and the good thing was my husband and I are like pro canoers. We actually are very good at canoeing. So I had some confidence about the moment that was in We loaded the sleeping bags and we loaded our clothes and all the things into the middle of the canoe. My two-year-old, who was potty training at the time, had her little potty seat with her. So we put that in the front of the canoe and I put her on top of it. That was her seat. And I got in behind her with my oar. I think that's what they're called. And uh, and my husband went to the water and I began to paddle. And I mean, we just started going. And it was awesome. I don't know if I'm doing this correctly, but you know, this is kind of what it looks like. And we're just paddling down the river. And we were feeling really good about ourselves because we were like light years ahead of all of the rest of our our And we're like, we got this down. And my little two-year-old's on our potty seat, just, you know, smiling, looking at the water. And all of a sudden we come up and we're looking in front of us and we're like, this is really odd as we're paddling down the river and we're staring and in front of us is a cow. (laughs) How's the cow in the river? And then all of a sudden we realize that the cow is standing on a riverbed and the river takes a sharp right and then a sharp left as it wraps around the corner. So Carrie and I begin paddling as fast as we can and he's yelling to me what direction to paddle in the stress. We're paddling as fast as we can and we take a sharp right and then we take a sharp left. And as we take the sharp left, jetting out across the river is this massive tree with arms and branches that just look like they're gonna poke your eye out. And my two-year-old is in front of me and I do what any mother would do to protect their child. And I grabbed my two-year-old down so that she wouldn't get poked by the branches. Do you know where I'm going with this story? And I tip our canoe over in the middle of the river. And luckily my little girl was wearing a life jacket and I fished her up out of the river and I'm standing there, my clothes soaking wet. She's crying, screaming. People are looking to find the sleeping bag that's floating down the river. They're grabbing our bags of clothes. And I am like, I told you we shouldn't go camping. And they're like, okay, we gotta get you back in the boat so that we can keep going. We gotta find a place to camp. And I'm like, no. We're going to camp right here. And everybody's like, so we pull our canoes off into the riverbed and we set up camp and we spend the most awful night of my life shivering, sharing somebody else's clothes and blankets, somebody else's sleeping bag, bundled up trying to survive the night. And we spend the most awful night in this place. Sound of moo. There's not just one cow. There are a lot of cows that call this riverbed home. And here we are just miserable and angry and resentful and cold and all of the feels. And my husband's like, up in the canoes because we need to leave. And I am like, we are not getting in that canoe. My daughter's crying. He's like, Megan, we cannot stay here. So we had to jump in the canoe and do it afraid to go on to the next place where we needed to go. And I tell you because it's funny, but also because what happened to us is we set up camp in our place of pain, in the place where we were cold, where we were angry, where we were resentful, where we were so frustrated about the current circumstances that we were facing, up camp. And I just wonder how many of us in this room might have a tendency to set up camp in the place of pain. I wonder how many in this room might have been offended, hurt by somebody in the past. 
maybe a loved one, maybe a spouse, maybe a friend who betrayed you, who let you down. I wonder how many of us have had an experience with someone where we've allowed offense and bitterness and unforgiveness and resentment to cause us to set up camp in a place of pain. And now every relationship that we enter into, we see it through that kind of filter. They're gonna let me down. They'll probably reject me. They will probably hurt me. I don't know if I can trust them. It becomes the filter in which we see them because we've set up camp. I wonder how many in the room maybe have walked through a moment that should have never happened to you. I wonder how many are here and things have been said to you or done to you that should have never occurred whether it be sexual abuse from a family member or friend, verbal abuse, physical abuse, and you find yourself constantly going back to that place of pain because the wound is deep and so real that you feel like it becomes a filter through which you see your entire future and what's ahead of you. For some of you, it's been attached for far too long to a, a feeling of shame that is not yours to carry. I wonder how many people in this room might identify with setting up camp in a place of pain because you've just been beaten down by life. Like you feel like the circumstances of your life have just been out to get you. Everything crashing in around you a relationship ending, financial trouble, issues at work, problems with your kids, and you just feel so overwhelmed by all of the things, all of the punches that you've taken, and you find yourself just setting up camp in the place of pain. In fact, it's all you can talk about. And in fact, you curse it and you repeat the stories to anyone that you talk to because it's kind of become your identity. This is just the suffering that I've got to be used to but it's never a good idea to set up camp in a place of pain. Because just like that riverbed where we set up camp that day, it was not a good place to go out. Earlier today, I just had this feeling that there's maybe some of you who've set up camp in a place of pain. And because you feel so overwhelmed, or because there's an ache inside of your heart that maybe you feel like no one understand. There's a void and there's a thing inside of you that's just desperately seeking to be known and to be loved, but you feel like you can't trust anybody around you in your world. And I just wonder how many people have found themselves camping in this place of pain and hiding out. And here's where I begin to numb out. I begin to struggle with areas of addiction that I don't want anybody else to see. In fact, hide out and pain so that nobody has to know what I'm actually walking through or dealing with. Numbing out, isolated, alone, but yet on Sunday, come out of the tent for a minute and I go to church and I put on a smile and I worship God and I connect with people and maybe go to lunch with some friends afterwards, but nobody knows the place where I've been living. And I'm just here to tell you, God has a plan for freedom for you today. You do not have to set up camp in a place of pain. You do not have to live isolated and alone. You do not have to live from a place of fear and anxiety any longer. This is the place where you were, and we cannot erase the things that experiences with. We cannot erase the things that have been done to us. We cannot erase the moments that we've encountered that have been overwhelming and hard. But what God can do is he can come in and mend a broken heart. He can offer healing and hope for a future because that's the nature of the God we serve. So we cannot stay. 
We cannot set up camp in the past. You know, for some of you setting up camp in the past, it might not be a place of pain. Maybe it's just remembering the good old days. Kind of like the proverbial high school football player who's always pointing to the trophy that's on the wall. You know what I'm talking about? Always think back to, well, when this was happening, this was good. We can't live in the past. God's called us into a beautiful future. You know, there's a man in the Bible who set up camp, I believe, in the past in a place of pain. And it's found in Genesis chapter 11, verse 27 through 28. I'm gonna introduce him. It says this, now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And you're like, who is this guy and what are you talking about? If you're in the Bible, you've probably heard a story about a man named Abraham who was, God spoke to him and he was brave enough to go to inhabit the promised land that God would give to his nation, Israel. Well, Terah is his dad. So when it says that Terah fathered Abram, that was just his name before God changed it to Abraham. Are you following where we are in the Bible right now? Okay, so Terah, we meet him and he, we hear about his sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran was the father of Lot. But it says this, and we don't always get every detail of what's happening in the Bible, but the one thing that we did hear here is that died in the presence of his father in the land of Ur of the Chaldeans. So this dad had experienced a kind of loss that many of us will never know. And maybe you're here and you've walked through the loss of a child. And what I know is that they say that you never actually completely get over. The grace of God carries you through those hard, dark moments. But this was, this was Tara. His son had died. And can you imagine, I just, could you put yourself in those shoes for a moment? Like probably a father just going, be me first. It wasn't supposed to be him. He's got a son, like it's not fair, God. Maybe you found yourself there before where you've just been in a moment of like, it's not fair, God, why is this happening to me? And I imagine Tara felt those same things. And I want you to get that perspective of where he was at because then we read on in the scripture. In verse 31, 32, one day, Terah took his son Abram and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abraham's wife, and his grandson Lot, his son Haran's child, and he moved away from Ur of the Chaldeans. He was headed for the land of Canaan, but they stopped at Haran and they settled there. And 205 years, this is back where they lived forever. Terah lived for 205 years and he died while still in Haran. Now here's where I wanna use a little imagination. The Bible doesn't tell us this. But what I do know is that many, many years later, God would to Abraham and he would say, I want you to take your family and I want you to go. And Abraham's like, go where? And he's like, I want you to just head on out and trust me with the direction and go to this promised land that I have for you and for your people. And Abraham was brave and courageous enough to do so. But I just wonder, is it possible that that same call that God gave to Abraham, that many, many, many years before, hundreds of years before, he had given to his father, Terah? It says that Terah took his family and he left Ur of the Chaldeans. The he left to head towards Canaan, which just happens to be, you guys, the modern day promised land. So I just wonder, is it possible that God had spoken to him some promises as well? But it says that Terah takes his family and they start out on the journey to where they're supposed to go. And it says they arrive at a city named which just happens to be the name of his dead son. And it says he settled there and he lived for 205 years and he died while still in Haran. And I just wonder, if Tara was so great because the loss was so real, because this place where he was visiting reminded him so much of the internal struggle where he was at, if he had just set up camp there and delayed the promises of God for generations to come. 
And here's what's what I want to tell you today. There's a call of God on your life. We know this, the Bible tells us this. I can give you scripture after scripture. You're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he planned in advance for you to do. He created you with purpose. And if we allow ourselves to set up camp in the pain of our past, it won't just affect us, it will affect the generations that are coming after us. That day on the riverbed, if Brooklyn and I had refused to get back in the if we said, no, we're gonna stay here on this riverbed campsite, if we'd said that, it wouldn't just affect us. We had 40 other teenagers with us. We had adult leaders with us. The call of God on your life is not just about you. And I believe that today, offer you healing and hope and peace and joy, but it's time to pack up camp. It's time to pack up and to move into the new season that God's calling you to, amen? Hey, there's another place we have a tendency to set up camp. We have a tendency to in the present. And I know you're like, well, Megan, is that really that bad? Like being present is good, being in the moment is good. And yes, it absolutely is. I'm a next kind of girl. I'm always thinking about the next thing and people have to remind me to be present in the right now, to enjoy the moment. When I had all of you mamas and little kids and they were little and demanding and there was so much going on, I remember just wishing, can we just get through this season? Can we get to the other side of this? And people would tell me all the time, Megan, just enjoy the season. It goes by fast. And I'm like, great. That's really easy for you to say. You have no idea what my day is like. But you know, my daughter has been away at college now for several years and it went by like this. And I look back and I remember what people said. It is, it is important to enjoy the moments. But I just think that some of us have a tendency to set up camp in the present in the sense that we get really comfortable you have a couch or a seat at home that is your seat? Anybody? You're allowed to talk back in church, so you can like raise your hand and talk. I have this place on my couch, this brown tan leather couch, and I love it. I've actually taken it from my husband because I really wanted this seat. And, um, and my couch kind of swallows you. You have to commit to it. If you're gonna sit on it, you commit to it. So you just like jump in and it swallows you and it's fabulous. And I grab a blanket and that is my spot because that is my comfort zone, right? And some of you know what I'm talking about, but I'm just afraid in life, many of us are present in the way in which we have become so comfortable, we don't want anything else to interrupt us. I hate it when my dogs start pawing at the door or whining to go outside when I'm on my spot in the couch. I don't want to get up. Or when my kids are yelling, mom, it's like, fine, I'm comfortable. I hate it when there's an inconvenience that wants me to get out of my comfort zone. And I'm just afraid that too many of us have found ourselves there, constantly looking for ways that we can be comfortable. You know, the pandemic, it did so many in our nation, in our world, in our churches. And the one thing I look at and I go, man, I just don't think this was such a healthy thing is it caused all of us to be so inwardly focused. It was like, I'm gonna take care of me and mine, me and my family. As long as me and my family are okay, we're good. And it just kind of inward focus. I'm gonna self-care became the like number one word on the scene. And I do think you should take care of yourself. Your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. God's entrusted you to take care of yourself, to steward your time, to steward your body. God's entrusted you with that. But it just became this hot button word of, I can't do anything for anybody else because I need to. And I think what it really became was selfish. And I'm not, I'm again, don't hear what I'm not saying. It's so crucial that you learn how to steward the life that God has entrusted you with. But part of the life that God's entrusted you with is not about you. It's about his purpose for the kingdom of God. And you, you gotta know that. I just think we became so inwardly focused. You know, there's this body of water in Israel and it's called the Dead Sea and maybe you've heard about it. And the Dead Sea is this place where nothing lives. And nothing can live because it's so full of salt that nothing can live. 
And the reason for that is because every body of water travels into the Dead Sea, but nothing flows out of it. Everything's pouring into it, but nothing is flowing out of it. And in that place, there can be no life. And the same thing goes for your life. If you're everything's filling you up, everything's pouring into you, but there is not a place in your life where you are pouring out, where you are investing your life to make a difference in somebody else's life. There is nothing that can flourish in that place because God created you with a purpose, but for a purpose as well. And I just am afraid that too many of us have in the present with this just like comfortable mentality. This is what it is mentality. And God's saying there's more. There's more. I think a lot of us can easily get to the place where we don't want to say yes to something God's asking us to say yes to because it's going to demand off of the couch, the proverbial couch of our life and do something that's going to stretch us, that's going to be difficult for us. I'm just here to say, and I get to say this because I'm visiting and I go away and you don't have to listen to me again. This church, this beautiful church that you're part of, they don't show up and it looks like a church. They show up and it looks like a high school and many of you are a part of making that happen. But I think it's so easy to just show up to church, camped in the present. Don't ask me to do anything that would just life. I want to come in and experience incredible worship, which you do. I want to come and drop my kids off in somebody's capable hands. Somebody that's serving, by the way. I want to come in and man, I hope the word applies to something I'm dealing with today. Why? Fill me up. Fill me up. But if nothing is pouring out of your life, if there's not a place where you're willing to make a sacrifice, where you're willing to say, I'm gonna wade into the water and I'm gonna do something with my life because I have purpose and my purpose is to live my life to build God's house. If there is not a season for you, you say yes to being a part of a team that's building the house of God, you are missing out on a flourishing life. And they didn't ask me to preach this. It's just like God was like, you gotta talk about this for a minute. Hey, you know, we live in a region where there are 3.2 million people, 3.2 million people in Orange County. Less than 10% attend church, which means there are quite probably 2.7 million people who do not know the hope that is found in Jesus, who have never experienced what you've experienced or what I've experienced in a moment of worship, who haven't heard the word of God where it the places of pain in their life. There is a region that is in desperate need of Jesus. And the only way they're going to hear about it is if there are people who are willing to say, I'm going to get out of my comfort zone. I'm going to stop camping in the present and I'm going to go, God, what's next? What do you have for me? How do you want me to be a part of this great big? Place? There's a scripture verse in Romans chapter 13, verse 11 and 12. And this is the message paraphrase. And it says this, but make sure that you don't get so absorbed and exhausted in taking care of your day-by-day -day obligations that you lose track of time and doze off, oblivious to God. The night is about over. The dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what God is doing. Hey, the night is about over. The dawn is about to break in Orange County. Be up and awake to what God is doing. God's calling us out of the present with eyes for the future to do what you want to do. I know that for some of you, you feel the sweet conviction of the Holy Spirit in that. I think there might be others of you who are in a position where you're like, I'm just so tired. And I can, I can relate because when we came out of the pandemic, through this moment that I think that counselors, psychologists are now calling languishing. It's different than anxiety. It's different than depression. It's just kind of this like, almost like apathy. And I think a lot of people are dealing with that. Maybe discouraged by disappointment. Maybe feeling like there's dreams that you've had in your heart or things that you've tried to do that just haven't happened yet. And it's just left you feeling like, just tired. And I'm just here to tell you, I believe that God wants to reignite those dreams. I believe that he wants to speak to those places in your heart that need to be filled with hope again. 
wind of the Holy Spirit that is gonna actually propel you into the next season that God has for you. I believe that God is gonna do that for you. So if you're listening and you're just feeling like, man, I'm just so tired and it's just so much easier just to be still in the present and just, it is what it is. I'm here to tell you, it is what it is, but it's not what it seems. It is what it is, but it's not what it seems. God is still working. He's still on the throne. He's still got good plans for your life and for mine, so don't you be discouraged. We cannot camp any longer in the present. I wanna to talk to you about the place to set up camp in the final minutes that we have together. And I want a young man in the scripture. And uh, I think you're gonna start a series that's gonna go through his life. His name is Joshua. Maybe you're here and you're not as familiar with the Bible. Don't worry, just keep showing up. You're gonna learn all about it. But maybe you're here and you know who Joshua was. And Joshua ultimately became the Moses. Moses is the man that led the Israelites out of Egypt into the wilderness on the way to the promised land. Joshua became Moses' successor. And what I know about Joshua is Joshua was a mighty leader. He was a strong and courageous leader. God told him to be that several times, be strong and courageous. He was this man that was, an entire nation. When he spoke, people listened. They followed. He was this incredible leader. And so it begs the question of how did he get there? How did he become the man that God created him to be? And I think it has to do with where he set up camp. And I want to read you a portion of Exodus chapter 33, verse 7 through 11. And it says this, now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. Mind you, just like you're in a portable church right now that gets set up on a Sunday morning to host, they didn't have a church building in the middle of the wilderness, right? So they had a tent and they would set up the tent and it's at the tent of meeting that the presence of God would show up. And so Moses would go outside of the camp where all the people were and he would set up the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all of the people would rise up. Why? Because they had an expectation, right? They were like, something's about to happen. All of the people would rise up. And each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. And the Lord would speak with Moses. What is that? The Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud, Standing at the entrance of the tent, the people would rise up and they would worship each at his tent door. Thus, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to a friend. And when he again to go into the camp, so he's spent time in the presence of God and he turns to go into the camp. This is the line I want you to catch. His assistant Joshua, son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. He would not from the tent. See, we see right here what set Joshua apart. We see right here what caused Joshua to become a strong and courageous leader. We see right here what gave Joshua the tools for success in leading a nation. And I just wonder if there might be some people some businessmen or women that are looking for some answers or some solutions right now to the business or the company that you lead. And you're just going, I just don't know what the answer is. I, I think you could maybe borrow a page from Joshua, which we're gonna expand on in a moment. Find me at the tent. It says he would not from the tent. He wouldn't. Why? Because he recognized that there was something there that wasn't anywhere else. He had encountered the presence of a living God. So he set up camp in his He set up camp in his presence. And I just think that we could all learn from this day to set up camp in his presence. Why? Because it was at the tent of meeting that the tangible presence of God would show up and Joshua knew it. He saw when Moses would come out. There was something special that was happening and he was hungry for more. He was hungry for whatever he could experience of the tangible presence of God and nothing distracted him from it. I like to use my imagination in the scripture, but here's what I know. Joshua was a young man, just like you have been at one point or another, young man or young 
which means that he had a normal life. Like he had a mom and a dad, maybe some siblings. I'm sure he had friends. I'm sure that he had experienced some pain. Why? Because we all do. I'm sure that there'd been some circumstances in his life that were challenging. Why? Because Jesus himself said in this life, take heart for I've come to overcome the world. I'm sure he'd experienced some hard things. I'm sure he had an opportunity to set up camp in the pain of his past. I'm sure he had multiple opportunities to set up camp in the present, to just be comfortable, to just do what everybody else was doing. But yet Joshua made a decision. And I just imagine that when his friends are like, hey, Josh, hey, you wanna go with us today? We're gonna go down to the river and we're gonna skip some rocks. I don't know what else they would do in the wilderness. So that's what I'm coming up with today. Come on, Josh, we're gonna go. It's gonna be so much fun. You don't wanna miss out. And Josh is like, nope. Find me at the tent. Josh's mom is out. She's made dinner. She's looking for him. Hey, has anybody seen Joshua? Where is Joshua? Can he just be home on time for dinner one time? And everybody's like, check the tent. Find him at the tent. He understood that there was something about the presence of God that he couldn't get enough of. And when we look at the man that Joshua became, we find that the roots are in the presence of God. Joshua becoming the leader of Israel. Listen to me, those of you young people who have a desire to do something great with your life. Joshua becoming the leader of Israel to do with his ability to stand on a platform with a microphone. It had everything to do with his ability to get into the presence of God, to lean into the presence of God. Find me at the tent. Find me at the tent. You know, David said, Book of Psalms, chapter 26, verse eight, he says, Oh Lord, I love the habitation of your house, the place where your glory dwells. And David had that understanding too. There's something about the house of God, the place where your glory dwells. This church is such a beautiful, valuable gift. You don't wanna miss a Sunday because when the body of believers comes together and we exalt the name of Jesus together, the scripture says he inhabits the praises of his people. That means his presence shows up. There's something about it. There's something about encouraging one another in this walk of faith that we're walking out because life is not always easy. And you need other people around you who say, come on, I've got you, I'm gonna help you. Like you can't get to the tent on your own. It's all right, come on, grab my arms. I'm gonna get you to the tent. We need those people around us. But let me just tell you this camp in the presence of God, not just on a Sunday morning. It doesn't require a church service. It doesn't even require a worship team. You can camp in the presence of God in your room, in your car, in the bathroom, on a walk on the beach, in your office, wherever you might be. And I don't know what it looks like for you. For me, it looks like turning on some worship music. And the reason we worship is, is not just, they don't just sing songs up here. The reason we worship is because it fixes our attention on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It reminds us that no matter what I'm facing, no matter how overwhelmed I feel, no matter how tough this is, I serve a God in heaven who loves me, who's my healer, who's my hope, who's my strength, who's my joy. I have a God in heaven who sees me right where I'm at. And when I'm in his presence, I don't know lack. Find me at the tent. Find me at the tent. You know, in just a moment, we're gonna worship for just a minute or so together before we leave. Why? Because there's something about worship. She says, Jesus, you're what I want. And we're gonna do that. And I believe they're gonna have prayer teams that are gonna be here available to pray with you because there's some of you that have been of your past and it's time to walk in freedom. Pastor Taryn said so beautifully earlier where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, which means that in this place today, there is freedom. You don't have to walk out those doors the same way that you came in, but we confess our sins one to another. We confess another and it's right there that we find healing. So you might need to come forward and pray with somebody today. For some of you, you've been camped out in your present, just living a comfortable, self-focused life. And maybe today's the day to take a step of faith, to say yes to something that you know you've been supposed to say yes to. 
But for all of us, I think it's a moment to just pause in the presence of God and say, God, what do you want to say to me? What do you want to do in my life? Because when we draw near to him, he draws near to us, amen? Before we go into that time of worship, I just want to take a moment for those of you in the room, for those of you tuned in online, and I just want to give you an opportunity to start a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're here and you've been wrestling with your faith, just not really sure what to believe. But there's something inside of your gut today that says, I need this. And I just believe that that's the Holy Spirit drawing you. See, God loves you so much that the Bible says he sent his only give his life on a cross for you to pay the price because a price had to be paid for our sin. And God said, I'm going to do it willingly. There's nothing that you have to do to earn the grace and the goodness and the mercy of God. He said, I'm going to send Jesus to pay the price for you. But there's a starting point and the starting point is saying, yes, God, I'll follow you. Some of you are here and you've been running from God. Maybe you've been angry. Maybe you've been hurt. Maybe you've set up camp in the pain of your past and it's just time to come back. And I wanna invite you to pray this prayer with me as well. So if you're here and that's you, we're gonna pray a prayer and we're gonna pray it in the quietness of our own heart. But I just wanna ask you to make it with God. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Nobody looking around, nobody moving. And if you need to make a decision today to follow Jesus, let these be your words. Just simply say, God, I need you. Thank you for forgiving me. Today, I'm making a decision to follow you. And all around this room, if that's you, let these words be your own. Just say this, Jesus, I give you my life in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye still closed. Nobody looking around. This is why I exist as a pastor. It's why Zion Church exists as a church. I sure would love to be a part of that journey with you. So if you prayed that prayer with me, just as an act of faith, when I count to three, will you slip your hand up and slip it right? Are you ready? One, two, three. Awesome. I see those hands. Anybody else? Awesome. If I don't see them, I know God sees them. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in this place. God, I thank you for your presence. God, right now, we just invite you to have your way. In Jesus' name. Would you stand to your feet? We're gonna worship for just a moment. The prayer teams are available to pray with you. Don't miss a moment. Lean in for the few minutes that we have left together to the presence of God and invite him to have his way. God, whatever you want, I want. Lord, if you have it for me, I want it. So right now, collectively as a church, God, we just invite you to meet us here. God, to speak to us, give us peace. God, we want what you have. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name.